trying to give you some newest data and some update that was not present two weeks ago on the topic of puck cross-linking. May I ask you, especially in India, how many of you perform puck cross-linking for infectious ulcers? Okay. Now, these are my financial interests for this particular topic. As a background, um, the first case series on the effect of puck cross-linking was done in, in Zurich and in in published in 2008. But it was a seminal 2011 paper by Jes Mortensen from Sweden, who was bold enough to ask his ethical committee for approval of puck cross-linking as a primary procedure, so without the use of any antimicrobials. So this is before and this is after. He had a case series of 16 eyes and 14 of them healed spontaneously with just vitamin A in the post-up follow-up. Now keeping this in mind and looking into what a global burden infectious keratitis is, we should know that the sheer number of new cases per year is overwhelming. The WHO speaks of a silent epidemic which makes this disease one of the leading causes, leading causes of global visual impairment. And especially in India, I'm sure that you're facing a lot of corneal issues and corneal visual impairment due to infectious keratitis. Another element that makes the quest for anything that bypasses antibiotics and antimicrobials so important is the fact that antimicrobial resistance is growing constantly, every year at alarming rates. And we soon will run out of modern quinolones that will help us for example, in infectious bacterial keratitis. Element number four is, especially in a hot, humid country, the fact that it might be easier to treat an infectious keratitis in Switzerland because we have a rather cool, moderate climate, so it's 90%, 95% bacterial. But you are confronted with a lot of mixed infections. And then the adequate diagnosis and the adequate therapy is even more challenging. So a method that does both at the same time, maybe at various levels of efficacy, but still addresses both arms, fungus and bacteria, would be highly welcome. Lastly, costs are always an issue, and in many cases, you have medical-related costs, costs related to the therapy and costs related to the doctor. And in most countries, it is the doctor that is the limiting factor. We are simply too expensive for an infectious keratitis, where you tell the patient, come and see me three times next week. The patient will not come back. He cannot afford us. So any method that reduces the number of follow-ups and ideally would reduce the number of pathogen in the first, during the first visit and application would be beneficial. Now, just keep in mind that we do not only do stiffening in, in cross-linking. Whenever you perform a cross-linking procedure, you will induce four different effects. Also, when you treat keratoconus, you will stiffen, you will increase resistance to digestion, you will stop replication of anything living in that cornea, so the, the normal physiological microbiome will be gone too, and you will kill anything that lives in that cornea, including all keratocytes. We know that from cross-linking for keratoconus. All four effects happen for ictasia treatment, but number three and four are not relevant number one and two are. For infection, it's number two, three, and four. And number two might be the most interesting because you limit the final scar. If you increase the resistance to digestion, you do something no antibiotic can ever do, you increase the resistance. So the final amount of digested tissue will be smaller. So your resulting scar should be smaller. Keeping this in mind, how to develop puck cross-linking as an alternative means two things. Simplify and accelerate. Accelerate because if we want to simplify and go to the slit lamp, then the Dresden protocol is simply too slow. So the next question was, can we accelerate? We heard a number of talks this morning showing that acceleration in ectasia treatment is not that good of an idea. You can moderately accelerate. But if you go beyond 10 minutes, or faster than 10 minutes, then you run into issues. Why? Because of oxygen. So we tested the same in bacteria. And to our 
great surprise, we could accelerate down to 150 seconds at 36 milliwatts and still maintain the same efficacy in killing. So, very interestingly, this law, this bunsen rosco law, behaves totally different depending on the indication. Once we do keratoconus treatment, we have no correlation with bunsen rosco Once we do killing of bacteria, yes, it follows, it follows the effect. So three times more energy in a third of the time does exactly the same. Why? Well, we think we know why. Because the effect for biomechanics is oxygen dependent. The effect for killing is not oxygen dependent. You can kill almost as efficient um, in the absence of oxygen. So you have reduction of molecules. You have electron transfer for oxidative stress, but it's not necessarily mediated by the oxygen molecule. We are looking more into this, especially into hyperoxic conditions to see whether we can further increase killing. Now, keeping this in mind, you have two distinctly different pathways for biomechanics and for the antimicrobial effect using the same technique. <coughs> now, knowing all this, back to clinics, how to apply this? Well, let's accelerate. The first study we published last year in, in Cornea, this was a feasibility study, 21 eyes, where we added accelerated puck cross-linking <coughs> Um, with the above-mentioned regimen. The second study was more exciting because it, it involved more than 70 eyes, 74 eyes. And what we've seen here is that whenever you add puck cross-linking to antibiotics, the time to healing is significantly lower. So you heal five days faster in ulcers of a little more than three millimeters in size. Faster healing means less follow-ups, less costs provided, higher, higher likelihood that the patient will come to the follow-ups because you need less of them. And also, and this is, but this is hard to measure, theoretically the resulting scar should be smaller because you increase resistance to digestion. We, we are still looking for an experimental model on how to prove that, but it's not that easy. And these are the results, some of them, yeah. Now, this is all puck cross-linking as an add-on to antibiotics. The nicest thing would be to have two entirely separated arms to test the effect of every single approach. Antimicrobials alone versus puck cross-linking alone and, um, and this being performed in a randomized way. Our multi-center RCT has been going on for three years now. These are the countries involved, Naranaya, Narayana, Netvalaya is one of the sites, and we have China, Israel, and uh, Switzerland as the reading center. We have collected um, in an interventional prospective multicenter randomized controlled way data from 30 patients, 30 eyes, and they were randomly assigned either to cross-linking or to antimicrobial therapy. If any of the patients that received cross-linking alone would clinically worsen for more than one day, it's a failure because it has to be treated by antimicrobials. So the outcome so far, ever, average uh, ulcer size is similar. The time to epithelialization is different, distinctly different. It needs almost more than five more days for the PAX-CXL group to heal. First you would say, oh yeah, it takes longer. No, the answer is, it heals without antibiotics. It takes five days more, but it heals after a single treatment. And that's the main message. And that is quite amazing. How many of the Paxixel corneas behaved like this? 85% so far. So in eight to nine out of 10 patients, no more anti antibiotics given in this trial. In the future, I'm not propagating only using puck cross-linking. This is a study. We just want to separate the effects. Of course, we will still continue giving antibiotics. But this shows to us how powerful the effect of puck cross-linking alone is. And these are rather small ulcers. This sounds small, but it was up to four millimeters um, as inclusion criterion. 
And if you go bigger than this, yes, you will have less of an effect, but you will still kill, and you will still increase resistance to digestion. So I advocate the use of puck crosslinking in any ulcer for various reasons. But here, yes, the green barrel simply means healing without antibiotics. These are some of the cases. Staph aureus. This is all from the puck crosslinking arm. Here, one more. Now, the most common bacteria were gram positive, and the co most common fungus was Aspergillus. Dropouts. What about dropouts? We had three dropouts in these 30 eyes, two in the puck cross linking uh, arm, which means that two of the, of the eyes treated needed additional antibiotics, and then they healed. But per definition, this is a dropout, and one eye developed a perforation in the medication group, not in the cross-linking group. So overall, we are at 85% now and counting. We will still continue accumulating more data. But already now, we, are, we, have, we have by far reached significance in the, in the end results. Our ongoing research is concentrating on making the um, the whole thing more efficient. Blue is 5.4 joule, yellow is 7.2 joule, and uh, even with the, with the Bacillus subtilis that is used here, efficient, efficacy of killing increases drastically. And what we have done now uh, last year is going up, way up in fluence, up to 64 joule, just to see where is the end of the, of the curve, of the, of the killing curve. And it is Interestingly, you have the biggest increase and you hit almost 100% at 15 Joule. And 15 Joule is what we already use in customized cross-linking in keratoconus. It apparently is not a danger to a transparent keratoconus cornea. It will probably not be a danger to a less transparent bacterial ulcer cornea. So we are going way up now and we will, we will try to find a, an optimum there between 10 and 15 Joule for the future treatment. And I'm sure that we will see massively increased efficacy. The data that you have seen before in the multicenter trial were 5.4 and 7.2 joule. So imagine how, how much better we can get with 10 and 15. What about these two, HSV and Acanthamoeba? I would say for now, please do not try to cross-link them if, if you have a clear clinical suspicion of these two entities. But we are currently in Zurich in the Department of Medical Microbiology studying uh, acanthamoeba cysts. So maybe um, there is more to say in a few months. One last word about the chromophore riboflavin. We called the, we baptized the method PUC crosslinking, which stands for photoactivated chromophore and not photoactivated riboflavin, because even four years ago there were already other chromophores like, like Rose Bengal. That, that appeared on the scene, and riboflavin might not be the ideal one. We'll, we will see in a few years, but the concept of photoactivating a chromophore, I think, will for sure prevail. Now, acceleration works to simplify. Simplifying means slit lamp cross-linking. This has gone a long way since the very first uh, attempts. This was back in 2011 when my postdoc, Olivier Richo, came to me and said, look, I can there is a new LED so small, I can put it on the tip of a Goldman tonometer head. And I said, interesting, well, if, it, if this is so small, why don't, we, why don't we put it onto the slit lamp? Now, eight years later, we are there. The CE mark will be obtained in the month of June. And this is the CI device. It's a spin-off company from the University of Geneva. The device will be highly Mobile, it will deliver a number of different intensities, continuous and pulsed light, it will have beam optimization. And of course, you can use it however you want, you can use it at the slit lamp, but also on a regular stand, like all the other machines. Why did it, why did it take so long? It took so long because of riboflavin. riboflavin had a huge issue with the regulatory affairs of the European community, who decided five years back that riboflavin all of a sudden is not a medical device, but a pharmaceutical, which made the, the CE mark for new riboflavin 
very, very difficult. And as a, as a new company, we did not want to de depend on the big ones. So we created our own and we obtained the CE mark. So now there is no more obstacle to, to, to present this. There will be a consumable kit with, um, with a, a sterile cap that protects uh, the device and the eye from contamination. This was an earlier prototype. This is how it can look um, in the future. Is there a problem with riboflavin in the upright position? Because we instilled the drops um, in a lying position on a reclining chair and then we irradiate in the upright position. Is this a problem due to gravity and changing riboflavin concentration? That was a very simple experiment. The answer is no. Once riboflavin is saturated, you can put a person in the upright position and for one full hour there is no major shift in riboflavin concentration. So you can easily treat at the slit lamp. And why not also keratoconus? Ten minutes for a young person is absolutely feasible. And hopefully we will have slightly faster protocols in the future. The whole thing will be presented at the CSO Italia booth at ESCRS if you're interested. Thank you for your attention.